Hi, my name is Liz Reichman, and I'm a docent at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in San Antonio and a history grad student at UTSA. I'd like to talk to you about women in the Holocaust. In this first part of a two-part lecture, I'll discuss the more theoretical aspects of the topic. Why study women in the Holocaust? And how were women's experiences in general different from men's experiences in the event? In the second part, I'll explore the stories of four young Polish women who survived the Holocaust and show through their stories some of these basic principles for how women's experiences different, were different from men's experiences. But let's start with some definitions. We'll advance the slide. I just want to remind you what the Holocaust was. The Holocaust was the systematic bureaucratic state-sponsored persecution and murder of approximately 6 million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. Why do we study the Holocaust? Here at the museum, we study it to promote tolerance and educate about the danger of hatred and prejudice, to inspire people to use this knowledge to critically analyze moral issues and human behavior in their daily lives. We wanna teach ourselves and others not to remain silent. With that in mind, let's ask why to study women in the Holocaust. Now this will show that I'm a history grad student and sort of a nerd because this is historiography. It's the history of the history and how what we want to study about the Holocaust has changed over time. Until fairly recently, the late 1990s, women in the Holocaust were not studied as a separate topic. The reason? Well, one reason was a fear of trivializing the Holocaust, of anecdotalizing it. That if we studied women in the Holocaust, we'd study Hungarians in the Holocaust, uh, Polish people in the Holocaust, but maybe someday also left-handed dwarves in the Holocaust. That there was a feeling that this was a vast experience, a monolithic experience that was shared by all Jews, suffering of all Jews, and to break it down into different segments, to try to overanalyze it, would trivialize it, would make light of it. A second reason that women in the Holocaust weren't studied in the beginning was a fear of comparing suffering. That if we broke the Holocaust down into different groups, into men and women and Hungarians and Polish Jews, we'd be tempted to compare what they went through. Did women have a worse time than men? Did Polish Jews suffer more than Hungarian Jews? It was unseemly to try to compare suffering. And so there was a feeling that groups shouldn't be analyzed separately. There would be too much of a temptation to compare. A third reason that women weren't studied separately was in the beginning, the wound was too fresh. Among Holocaust survivors in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, people were too busy getting on with their lives. They were moving to new countries, they were raising families, they were starting new careers and jobs. They wanted to move on and, and they didn't want to think about their particular experiences. They didn't want to be analyzed by social scientists or historians. People just wanted to live their lives. Secondly, among people who didn't experience the Holocaust directly, but were alive during World War II, there was a lack of perspective. The war was a world war, and it had affected everyone who was alive during that time. There was so much experience, so many details, that it wasn't clear which events were the most significant events. Certainly, people knew about the Holocaust and, and knew about it when it was happening. It was written about in the New York Times. It was written about in the Times of London. It was discussed on the BBC. So the Holocaust wasn't a secret, even when it was going on. But the details and the significance of it weren't really felt until some time later. And it was only later that people wanted to appreciate and study the Holocaust, that the significance of it rose up. And initially, as I stated, it was seen as a terrible monolithic event, something that was incomprehensible, that could not be understood. This perspective changed over time. It started to change as its significance was realized and we decided with knowledge of this event. Remember the mission statement that I read at the beginning? As we decided that we needed to prevent any further Holocausts, we realized we needed to understand what caused this one. How did Hitler come to power? 
how and why were so many ordinary people complicit in murdering Jews? To understand what happened, to prevent what happened, we had to analyze what happened. We had to make it comprehensible. And to make it comprehensible, we had to study it and we had to study the experience of different groups. So it became more acceptable to study uh, women in the Holocaust as well as other groups. The experiences of, different, of Jews in different geographic regions, for example, became more acceptable. Secondly, there came to be a feeling that those of us who weren't alive during the Holocaust, uh, and certainly those of us who, who might not meet survivors, would have a hard time understanding the vastness of it, the horribleness of it. It would become just dates and figures that were memorized by school children. Six million dead? It would be a, a question on a test, but there wouldn't be understanding of what that meant. What did mass murder really mean? How do you wrap your mind around six million? One way, and you, you may have read about this, is school children collecting pennies. You may have read about the efforts of children to try to collect six million pennies so they can put them in one place and get an idea of what six million looks like. Another way of trying to understand this loss and this horror is by exploring individual stories. To hear about six million deaths is overwhelming, but to explore one death or the experience of a certain kind of people is something we can understand. It became more acceptable to study individual stories again. Third, this study of groups that hadn't been studied in general became more acceptable in history. Uh, today we read about stories of black Americans that have been forgotten because they haven't been studied. Certainly, if the stories of women aren't studied, they'll be forgotten. For many years, the idea of a Holocaust survivor was someone like Elie Wiesel or Primo Levi. Men. The only woman we remembered was probably Anne Frank, a little girl who was hiding in an attic. But there are more stories than that, and the story is broader than just those three very well-known stories. Now, if this idea of telling the stories of particular groups, or else we might forget them, seems very contemporary, very 21st century, I have to tell you that it's not. We'll advance the slide. In 1941, this man, Emanuel Ringelblum, was interred in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was a historian. He was afraid that the Nazis would kill all the Jews in Europe. Not only that, he was afraid that they would destroy the memory of Jews ever living in Europe. And because he was a historian, he wanted to prevent that. To do so, he gathered up as many artifacts as he could find in the ghetto pamphlets, diaries, journals, uh, play programs, anything he could find, and he put them in time capsules. You see some of those pictured here. Many of them were just milk jugs, but he put those artifacts in there and buried them in different places around the ghetto. In 1941, it looked like the Nazis might succeed. They might destroy all the Jews in Europe and destroy the memory of all Jews in Europe. And Ringelblum, the historian, hoped that someday, in 100 years, in 500 years, in 1,000 years, someone would dig up these time capsules and remember that there had been Jews in Europe. Ringelblum, in 1941, made a special effort to collect the stories of women. He knew that if he didn't make the effort, the stories of women would be forgotten. So he collected the stories of women. Thus we see the history of the historiography. Uh, it went from being afraid to talk about specific stories to now an acceptance sort of circling back to Ringelblum that it is important to talk about the experience of specific groups. So what are the differences? Now we can advance the slide again. As I mentioned, in the 1990s it became acceptable to talk about women in the Holocaust. And in the late 1990s there was a big conference where scholars came together and talked about the experience of women. Five big differences in the experience of women emerged from that conference. They're listed here and we'll explore them one by one. The first is that fewer women than men escaped. You may already know that many Jews did escape from Germany, from Austria. Even the early 1930s, they could see that things were deteriorating and they had to get out. 60% of the Jews in Germany, 67% of the Jews in Austria escaped from their home countries. 
Now, many of them escaped to surrounding countries, to the Netherlands, uh, to France. And so they were affected by the Nazi regime spreading out across Europe, but they did escape from their countries. Few of these escapees were women. The reasons? Well, the first was economic. A family would have limited resources, and so they would try to get the member of the family who had the best chance of getting a job or starting a business and sending for the rest, sending for the rest of the family, they try to get him out. That person was usually a young man. So families would choose for economic reasons to have a young man and not a woman escape. Secondly, for reasons of safety. In the 30s, particularly in the early 30s, for example, during Kristallnacht, men were targeted by the Nazis. Men were arrested, men were killed, men were beaten up, particularly young men. So a family that had a young man would try to get him out so that he would be safer. At that time, the belief was that Germans hated Jews, but they were civilized. They wouldn't kill innocent women and children, would they? At the time, it seemed rational to get young men out of the country first. As a result, women were left behind. For example, in the Lodge ghetto, 60% of the people there were women. The third difference in women's experience in the Holocaust had to do with women's roles as caregivers. Women were the ones then and now who are the primary caregivers for the elderly and for children. Uh, women would be reluctant to escape. Another reason why women didn't escape because they had old parents to take care of or maybe young children to take care of. They didn't want to leave those people behind and it was more difficult to escape if you were escaping in a group. I'd like to talk a little more about the experience of women as mothers. It made them less likely to escape. It made it more difficult for them to hide if they were hiding with children. It also gave them a different experience in the camps. Now, Jews taken to a camp that was just a death camp, like Treblinka, where every Jew died, mothers and children would, would be sent to the gas chambers together and, and they would be killed together. Women coming to a mixed camp, a camp that was both a death camp and a work camp, a selection process would be made and young able-bodied people might be sent to work instead of sent to death. But if a mother arrived with young children, even if she was young and able to work, she was immediately sent to death. The reason? The Nazis thought it would be more orderly. If they separated a woman and her young children, the children would cry. The mother would cry. They would make a fuss. The children would be difficult to control. But if they sent the mother and the children together, it would be quieter, more orderly. So a woman arriving at, the, at a... Auschwitz would be sent with her children to the gas chamber. And of course, a pregnant woman would immediately be sent to the gas chamber. And here the rationale would be the Nazi ideology of eliminating Jews. That if you eliminated a pregnant woman, even if she was young, even if she was able to work, you would be eliminating two Jews. It was more worthwhile. I'd like to share with you another story about mothers in the Holocaust. Um, I think it's a powerful story shows the perspective of the mothers themselves. Theresienstadt was a, a model concentration camp. It was a camp where Jews were treated a little better. It was the camp that the Nazis showed to the Red Cross when they tried to argue that, no, they weren't mistreating Jews. In Theresienstadt, Jews were allowed to live in family units, or they were until 1944. The war was going badly in 1944, and even in Theresienstadt, a selection started to be made with some Jews being sent to work and those who were too old to work being sent to their deaths. Now, Jews had been living in family units and a Nazi official decided, and I, I struggle for the right adjective to use, but let's say he understood what was going on and he decided to give mothers a choice and to ask them, if they would rather be sent to work and their children be sent somewhere else to be relocated and in the meantime taken care of by the grandmothers or and be relocated. He didn't spell out exactly what was going to happen, but he certainly knew and the mothers certainly knew what was going to happen. 
out of 600 mothers, 598 chose to go with their children. Only two mothers chose to send the children with the grandmothers and potentially save themselves by going to work. So being a caregiver, being a mother in particular, had a huge effect on how a woman experienced the Holocaust. A third difference was that more women were able to pass, uh, to pretend that they weren't Jewish, that they were Christian women living in whatever country they were living in. In fact, of the people who passed, an astonishing 69% were women. The reason, well, the first reason uh, is surprisingly obvious, although you may not have thought of it, it's physiology. Jewish men were circumcised, Christian men were not. A man might be doing a masterful uh, version of passing, but if he were ever seen naked or if he were ever asked to pull down his pants, he would be discovered. And women didn't have that physiological difference. They looked like any other woman and there was no physical way to tell that they were different. So women had more success in passing. A particular kind of woman had uh, success in passing though, I have to say. That would be a young, single, uh, secular, public school educated woman. And the reasons for this are interesting to explore. And then the second part, when we talk about the stories, it becomes more clear why this is true. Um, a young woman who was sent to public school would learn to speak the native language. For example, if she was Polish, she would speak Polish. And she would speak Polish like any other Polish girl. She would use the same slang. She would have the same pauses. She would dress the same. She would know what the latest interests for young Polish girls were. She might also pick up some other languages. She might speak a little Russian. She might speak a little German. But she would have the ability to blend in because she'd been educated with other non-Jewish girls her own age. And in fact, we find that these kinds of girls had a lot of success thanks to their uh, special conditions. A fourth way that women had a different experience of the Holocaust is that women were more likely to work together. They were more likely to form collaborative uh, groups, especially collaborative, I'll say emotional groups, both in the ghettos and in the camps. Men, and this, of course, this isn't true of all men, but more generally of men, were more likely to go through the Holocaust alone as lone wolves, not trusting anyone and certainly not forming new emotional attachments. So what did women do? Well, for example, they formed sort of new families in the camps with an older woman being uh, the mother, not the biological mother, but the symbolic mother to a group of younger women. And the women would kind of take care of each other in the camp. It would have some practical results. For example, if a woman came to the camp, came to Auschwitz and was chosen to work, her hair would be shorn, she'd be tattooed, the Nazis would take her clothing and they would give her a uniform to wear. But they wouldn't take care that the uniform actually fit. They would just throw her a uniform and they'd throw her a couple of wooden shoes and she'd have to make the best of it. Well, later, when she was in her bunk, the other women would surround her and they would help her find a uniform that would fit and they would help her find wooden shoes that matched and they would try to put together something for her that would work. If her uniform needed to be mended, they had primitive ways of mending uniforms. So by working together, there were some practical ways that they were able to help themselves and each other survive. Secondly though, and perhaps more importantly, they gave each other emotional support. In some work camps, for example, and we read about this in Solace Gift in our own museum's reading club, uh, we discovered that women celebrated each other's birthdays in some of these work camps. They had meager rations, but they would plan ahead and they would take a pinch of everyone's rations and combine them together in a bread ball. And this bread ball, although it certainly wasn't a birthday cake, it was something. It was something that you could give to a woman on her birthday to show that you were thinking of her and that you remembered her birthday. Of course, you've probably heard of the most famous way that women collaborated in the camps, and that was by discussing recipes. Uh, that in their bunks late at night, they would talk about the Seder dinners they'd cooked, the chicken soups they'd made in great detail. Uh, it was one way to keep their minds fresh with, I suppose it was one way to deal with the omnipresent hunger they felt, was to talk about these recipes in great detail. Do you put the cumin in the soup? Do you not put the cumin in the soup? 
uh, it was a way of them remembering that they were still human. And that was probably the primary advantage that these collaborative groups had, that even while the Nazis were trying to dehumanize them, to treat them like animals, like subhuman, they still saw each other as human beings, remembering birthdays, mending uniforms, talking about Seder dinner's past, all of that showed that they still saw each other as human, and it was a way to fight against the Nazis. Of course, the final difference uh, is the one you probably thought of first, the fear of sexual violence. But certainly women were more vulnerable to rape and sexual violence during the Holocaust than men were. We moderns expect to see sexual violence during war or during genocide that we remember what happened to the Bosnian women during the breakup of the former, former Yugoslavia. We read about what's happening to the Rohingya women today, that when we see some conflict like this, we expect to see sexual violence. What's interesting is that as historians, we see fewer accounts of rape and sexual violence than we might expect. And so we have to ask why. One reason could be that in the 1930s and 40s, rape was more shameful than it is today. It happened, but women didn't talk about it, and they're still not willing to talk about it in their recollections of what happened to them during the war. A second reason could be that because of Nazi ideology, Jewish women weren't considered to be human. Uh, Germans could be punished for having sex with Jewish women. Certainly the women in the camp who'd had their hair shorn, who were starving to death, who were uh, suffering from typhus and dysentery were not attractive candidates even for rape. Certainly they would beat them, but maybe guards didn't rape as often because the women were in such sad shapes. Uh, perversely, that may have protected them from rape. But whether there were more rapes or fewer rapes in some ways is irrelevant because the fear of sexual violence was certainly omnipresent that women were always worried that that could happen, even if it wasn't happening. So those are the five differences that were isolated by the conference, uh, differences in how women experienced the Holocaust from men. And in part two, we'll talk about the stories of four young Polish women and how, what their experiences in the Holocaust were. <laughs>